Nathan Schaefer is a multimedia artist, writer, and bridge builder amongst communities in the Alaska Northwest. I first uh, got to know him as part of the uh, first contemporary art uh, augmented reality group, um, uh, Manifest AR, and I actually went to meet him in Alaska uh, to see his project, the um, Exit uh, Glacier Terminus project, and uh, as well as many other pieces like um, Seward Success and so on. We did uh, do a little bit of writing together, doing a um, presentation at the College Art Association from which he went on to do many projects, uh, including Dirigibles of Denali, and currently now Wintermoot, and um, the um, um, the press, uh, and I won't uh, mangle the uh, native wor um, word for it, but uh, in fish head soup. This year, Nathan got uh, for uh, the Wintermoot project and, um, and all his uh, bridge building projects. Uh, he got a ca creative capital award and um, he and I talk about this sprawling history and all of these different threads that feed into this really beautiful form of um, the maybe the oldest sort of uh, networking um, and how it's tying into contemporary media um, you know like uh, oral traditions and you know native networks and how this feeds into the sort of issues we're dealing with in um, speaking through the mesh. So this is a little bit of a long one, but it's worth it. And Nathan is a tremendously interesting person. And I think you'll enjoy what he has to say. And we're talking about uh, shared universe, um, dirigibles of Denali and, uh, and, uh, and winter moot, which, uh, uh, kind of came from is is this this kind of continuum of uh uh anglo indigenous uh, uh media works from um based in alaska and if i'm if i'm correct based on three different uh propositions of either like uh dome cities or mega projects or whatnot and um and um yeah, and so we can go back into what you were, your your the gold again, the gold. We yeah, were talking yeah, about yeah. What, yeah, well, yeah, it was yeah. Actually, it was it was the origin of the origin. why it was shared shared universe. Yeah, and the big answer was that there was three dome city proposed or three dome cities were proposed in Alaska, and I was building AR projects that had already built Seward success. And I had written a joke grant proposal, I ended up getting $18,000 from Rasmussen Foundation to do dirigibles of Denali. So I decided, hey, I'm gonna do this project. And then I started taking it a little more seriously. We presented in DC at some, some sort of Fakakta college artists, the co yeah, college we, artists yeah, we, association. Yeah, we, we did a paper on this at the, yeah, Washington DC. Um... Yeah, so, College Art Association, and yeah, and that was that was uh, awful. That was awful. I loved the group. I loved the Manifest AR people, like yeah. Tomiko and Will, and all that. That was it. Was hilarious to see my dad show up. Uh, I could not. Know, stand and that was also interesting. Is that you and I were also part of the first uh, contemporary AR group by uh, Manifest AR. That's also an interesting right. Point. Yeah, right. That, that's which how, was that's awesome. How I kind of got into got got introduced to your stuff. You know, like you know. Right. And we were like all scattered across the world. Yeah. So most of the Manifesto Arrow people I've never met. Right. Like, I don't know who Mark Squarek is. He, he sent me an email years ago and I'm like, who are you? But you end up having these interesting. So I, 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 I know you in person. I know Christopher Manzion because we went to school together. Right. And I met Will and Tomiko at that space. Right. Uh, one of my favorite AR artist Lillian Hungley. I've never actually met them in person. Me zoomed a couple of times. A couple of my favorites uh, as well. Also, Warren Armstrong out of Australia is one of my favorite AR artists, and I've never yeah. met him in person. 
why where I'm like off on a manifest they are they oh it yeah. was to say I I by that point in my life I was already teaching special education for public schools and it was a niche that I fit like perfectly into which I I I don't have like ways of explaining that to people like once you no. realize you could do something like that it's so highly specialized and specific and you, you just never know it, it it feels like when you watch the uh, America's Got Talent and you see people, you know, juggling a bunch of daggers that are on fire with their feet into a mouth and then catching it in their butthole or something. You're like, the best thing is not that you're excited by what they're doing. You're like, how the fuck did they figure out yeah, that they could uh, do that? Yeah. What, what was the series? Of especially the one thing, but we won't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was what it was like. Like, oh, you intrinsically know how to work with people or kids who have autism. You just, right. it, your your base level communicates highly effectively to children with autism. Right. And they almost immediately are willing to open up to me about a whole number of different things. And we just talk. So what I think it is, is just not like neurodivergence reads neurodivergence. So I'm not autistic, but my neurodivergence um, a, a, a allows for like a lot of overlap inside that area anyway i had already started a lot, working a lot, a lot of different things and i think that's something we have in common of course sure yeah yeah, yeah. for for sure but, but so i i had already like married that i realized oh i'm good at this also special education teachers like don't really ever get bothered but except like i not i i don't have to fight with other colleagues you know it, it, it's just so like the the idea of presenting at the college art association was just okay. stupid to me because like everybody's they're just yeah. willing to uh, eat each other alive. Well, you just, know what? Oh. <laughs> it was just, okay. it was such a desperate place that there was no space inside of the College Art Association's conference that actually was conducive to content of yeah, any yeah, yeah. sort. Yeah, I think we're a little <laughs> divergent here, though. You know, um, okay. Yeah, hey, yeah. No, hey, I, 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 I know. I, it's okay. I know you're beloved in those spaces. Like I remember no, no, presenting. No, no, it, it, no, no. I'm, 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 to, I'm being legit. Legit. Have to do with that. It, it's. It's. I'm. I'm just. I'm just moving the timeline. You know, because we got oh, a lot yeah, to yeah, talk okay, about. Okay. That's all. You know, that's that's. No, all no. We do. Mean. We do have a lot to talk about. Okay. So there's was about. another like back to shared universe then. Yeah. We were doing this project and we were presenting on these cities and we really hadn't done anything. I had built one of the AR pieces, but we were pre presenting. And th at that point, it was one book, and I had University of Alaska Press was going to publish the book. A hundred different things happened. We went through like all these different publishers. And I want to say it was like three or four times last minute, the publisher I was working with or we were working with just either stopped talking to me or just had like the strangest, rudest email. And I had a show coming up at a museum four dirigibles of Denali connected to the grant money I got in Alaska. Right. So I put a little logo and called my publishing company Shared Universe, which was right. a joke right. for me based on some of the fiction I was writing. Right. Uh, and it kind of had like a poetic thing. And then it made fun of that augmented reality artist thing where they had to put AR in everything in the yeah. titles. And then, and then, the, <laughs> and, and, and the, of course, and then, and then the the one thing I think that was really kind of interesting is that then, you know what what a lot of this was was basically based on, kind of like a, a multiverse based on quantum probability and that and and so that that opened it up for different variations, you know, of possibilities right. of these of these of these different cities and climate stuff. And there was a thing I think we talked about once about. Uh, Bruce Sterling looking for 22nd century science, you know, wanting 22nd yeah. century science fiction, and all this started coming together in, in that sort of thing. And you know, by that time, you know, you're running with the, with with dirigibles and and did that did that museum show. Yeah, and also uh, we were working with a bunch of science fiction authors, yeah. and then we started like a a bigger collaborative process, and then so, all the science fiction authors were Alaskan. So we, we, it, man, there's like a million pieces to this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it wasn't one book. It turned into, I think there was nine books. Right. For my show, I published five of them. 
that were available at the space. And then you had done like some way off shoot with another space. I don't even remember where it was from. Out of Portugal, I think. Yeah. But that didn't have the shared universe thing on it. It was like, um, it was just, the, uh, there were all these divergent paths on it. So the five bucks were the, like a, oh, no, one no, of them was no, called I, three I did, I did, I, I did, I did new memory rescue with abstract, right. uh, abstract press out of Spain. Oh, out of Spain. Okay. Yeah. But uh, the five shared universe, which was me using yeah. grant money from Rasmussen Foundation to publish books printed in Alaska. Right. The, yes. Those are the first things that had the shared universe logo on four of them. One of them, I didn't put it on there. At all. No, maybe I did. I don't know. I got to go look. I, it's been a while. So that was the Three Dome Cities. So an, an art history essay, full length, published like a little uh, middle school textbook. Yeah. The science fiction omnibus, which was the collection of all the sci-fi authors. And then you and I are fiction in there. Gravel proposes McKinley Bubble, which yeah. was, I went to the archive in Fairbanks to find out about Denali City because there was no images of Denali City, which was the goal that I was giving you before yeah. you started recording, was that Mike Gravel, who designed Denali City, there was no images of Denali City at all. No artist was ever hired to like conceptualize it, to render it, to like sell it. It was just all this big theoretical thing. And the Denali City archive in the Mike Gravel archive, like it's a small section of the Gravel archive at University of Alaska Fairbanks that I went to and I had like the white gloves and all. There was only two images of Denali City that Gravel drew on napkins. The, the napkins weren't in there. It was these old slides of the napkins. And the, sl <laughs> the slides are so old now that nobody has a slide reader or any of the things to like enlarge um, yeah. slides. So I, I had to kind of hold it at light. Um, I got some person was able to do a slide scan there, but it took, anyway. So um, Gravel proposes McKinley Bubble was a book I put together this is going to sound awful, but I hated the Gravel archive section on Denali City so much because all the images that looked like they would have been Denali City were actually uh, Fry Otto drawings for his projects mm -hmm. that were not the Denali City at all. Wow. And there were some amazing drawings in there, but there were actually no images of Denali City. And yeah. I had to come up with it all on my own, but I published a whole bunch of text from the Denali City Archive, but this is like my little like my little joke about it was I took all imagery out of those things and just published the words. So if it was a scan or a clip out from a magazine that would have had all these graphic designs and things, I took all that out. So it just literally looked like a collection of concrete poetry when you went through it. So it'd be maps without lines or dots. It would just yeah. say. Hmm place names and I thought it, they looked actually kind of beautiful yeah. uh, and then I did like this fake historical analysis introduction to it under this pseudonym which was actually the real name of a, a Dada poet I really love named well so his real name's Fabian Lloyd which is a nom de plume I was you know yeah, Arthur Craven was right. the name he went by in Dada circles so I had Fabian Lloyd write up kind of an introduction to why all that was going on. And then he wrote an introduction. So that was the third book in the series. The fourth one was uh, I took the Seward Success proposal from, there was two copies of it left in the world. One was at uh, the University of Alaska Anchorage Library. And yeah. I can't Because I saw that one. Yes, I think I took you to go see. Anyway. I made a copy of it and then I did a digital remaster of it and I published that. Mm -hmm. And then the fifth one was, um, it's actually a book of poems written by one of the fictional characters from the sci-fi omnibus who in the sci-fi omnibus, there was these collective stories called Dirigibles of Denali, which right. were based on the notion that of, of a fictional Alaskan reality television show called Dirigibles of Denali. Was great. Where different dirigibles crews were traveling between the dome cities, so we had all these little mini adventures that the the dirigible crews would get into. But they were written in a Alaskan reality show format, 
Yeah. Uh, but anyway, like, one of the characters like, inside. Most dangerous catch or something. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Alaska State first, yeah. whatever. North to the future. Yeah. Colonial is bullshit. They come up with and make it a television <laughs> show. That, that's like a whole other set of stuff that I want to get into at some point, but I'm probably going to. Sarah Palin's Alaska is really hilarious if you want to go watch some of that. But the guy's name was Peach McGillis, this fictional dirigible captain who was also a poet that I, I created this character with actually one of my friends who's a poet who grew up, we grew up together here in Anchorage. His name is Josh Metzger. He lives in New Jersey now, but we created this poet character uh, named Peach McGillis. And we did a book of poetry that Peach wrote. And that was called, I'm sorry, I'm gonna start laughing a lot. Some of these things are just like these funny jokes to me that I really like pushed for a long time. Anyway, the name of the book, of poems is called the post-apocalyptic crackerverse hypothesis yeah yeah which is uh, a good title yeah totally <laughs> that's like one of the best titles i've ever come up with yeah and it was three collections of chat books the first one was called fimberthill upwind fimberthill is the only named int wife from J.R.R. tolkien's sorry i'm still laughing again <laughs> lord of the rings <laughs> so it's a whole series of poems about like these kids who grow up without their their aunt wife mother <laughs> but it's like very alaskan at the same time uh the second one god what was it called well so the third one was called post-apocalyptic cracker verse hypothesis and that, that was a series of poems written by um by peach about all his favorite white hip-hop artists so there was actually a lot of concrete poetry in that. What was the second book of poems in post-apocalyptic Crackerverse hypothesis? Is Fimberthill up when? Now I gotta like look it up while we're talking. Okay. I'm gonna while all this is going on, I'm gonna go anyway. So those were the five books yeah. that were part of the original shared universe right. publishing. Right. But like you said, you had written New Memory Rescue, and Joel and I had actually done a show in Philadelphia <laughs> yeah. under the shared universe thing. Sure. And that was called Chichaco Wizard Suicide Runners, <laughs> yeah. which was the site-specific video game that was also part of the shared universe like world, because that's where it was a fictional video game inside of my Ravenade story <laughs> in the sci-fi. Yeah. Like, so what's going on? I mean, on it's all like all these interconnected things. Yeah, I think that, I think this is a one one thing here is that we're bouncing all over here like 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 some crazy pachinko machine you know what's going on here is that i think the 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 great the, you know as as you know i think the idea is is that that you know there's this there's this there's this multiverse you know that's based on these you know these these base on these basic premises and that sort of thing from which this you know this huge stuff stuff that's you know, this huge amount of stuff going on you know merging you know like Anglo and 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 and, and um, you know First Nations stuff going in and and you know people people are starting to take get attention. I mean you know pay a lot of attention. No, that, that's right. I I hmm. Dirge was a Denali. I think it had some good press. Most honestly, most of my work, I people kind of liked it a little bit, but it never really got responded to well. It was just okay. always. It was just always treated almost, I'm, and I'm not trying to make like a thing of it. It's just, it was treated a little bit more contemptuously Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. From, from my point of view. It was just sort of, so I, I had really defaulted a lot into just making funny things for me yeah. are really. Um, uh, so, so, so where's, where's Winter Mood come in? Where's right after this? Oh, okay. Hold on. I was wrong about that. So post-apocalyptic crackerverse hypothesis, the three books was previously on Frigger Rock was the first one. Yeah. And that was a whole set of stuff that actually became the basis for Winter Mood. Okay. Uh, then the Fimberthill Upwind. Yeah. Post-apocalyptic. Actually, all of these things, I, I think at some point in Winter Mood, I'm going to start putting some of these poems into the comic books. Okay. Anyway, so you were you were saying something about Winter Mood. Um, I wrote a story called Ravenade inside yeah. of the sci-fi omnibus. So that was set outside of Seward Success. 
Um, inside of that story, I created a video game universe that I, I haven't named, but I'm going to be going back to in a little bit. Uh, inside that video game universe, the, so uh, the idea was like I kind of recreated my my childhood in the '90s, right? So Nintendo didn't doesn't exist in this universe. It's uh, it's actually another group called Mingloth Incorporated, mm -hmm. and instead of Mario and Zelda, it was um, Cloudberry and Chichaco Wizard Suicide Run. Or the Chichaco Wizard. Yeah. So in this, this is like the fictional video game universe. And then also inside the Raven Aid logic, grunge rock never actually happened. Yeah. But during the 90s, what, what happened was Alaskan death metal. Oh, so the, the, the Alaskan death metal was what all the kids, it, it, if you just took Nirvana, Pearl Jam, Soundgarden out of the popular imagination. Right. And put you know, dumpster ravens, bone eating snot flower, and knick in. You get, you got like a whole change up in in cultures, and these all existed within the Dome City cultures. Right. And I, right. um, so but with Raven Aid, and with the, the collaborative stories and all these things that were going on, there was just all these little elements inside of them that I never got around to using. Like it was just right. so much world building that I couldn't keep track of it. Um. So that yeah. that project ended, and that's when some of like the people actually kind of liked it. And um, it wasn't specifically that; it was that I had worked with a lot. I've worked with a lot of people on projects before. Like this wasn't the first time I had, you know, a huge budget for an art project right. where I worked with tons of people. Like I actually really love huge budget art projects with tons of people. You know, it's, it's basically all I do now. Right, but the the people who had written enjoyed that process immensely so they were contacting me a lot they really wanted to keep doing stuff uh, so we would talk a little bit and then i had kind of i, I wrote the dirigibles proposal because a comic book project i wanted to do which was an anthology and historical look at Athabascan bluegrass, which is this whole other thing in Alaska. Bluegrass music evolved in Alaska at the same time it evolved in the, the US South. Uh, they have an equivalent time frame of, but the, the Alaskan story is way less known and it involves way less people, oddly enough, way more cultures. Um, and it's, it's, you don't, most people outside of Alaska, even most people in Alaska don't I mean, know much is, about is, is this actually a thing? This is legitimate. This uh, is so there's like this a, great a, book a, by... Athabascan Bluegrass is a Athabascan thing. Athabascan Bluegrass. So there was this great uh, anthropological study on it written by Craig Mishler called The Crooked Stovepipe. Mm. Um, anyway, so it was actually based... The reason I didn't do the project was Craig ended up not liking Augmented Reality when he saw it. And the whole project was contingent on this like weird thing he did in the book in the crooked stovepipe. So all I really wanted to do was do a comic book that had like just one page biographies or two page biographies on all the major fiddle players from Athabascan bluegrass mm -hmm. and then augments that played the, their music. Right. Sure. Like that, that was going to be the comic was a series yeah. of things. And I was going to do the first chapter because Craig in the first chapter of the crooked stovepipe he writes this fantasy story about one of the first um, white people to go up the YK Delta or the Kuskokwim with a fiddle. So the story goes that like a fiddle and a banjo, I'm way off on a tangent, but a fiddle and a banjo get left with uh, some Gwich'in people way interior Alaska by a white dude, I'd, I wanna say an Irishman and a Quebecois man. Huh. Way, way, way back when it was just folk music it wasn't bluegrass right yeah yeah so they left that and they had taught a couple jigs and reels to the people and then there was no contact for decades and then they got they, into it they the, and the the a bunch of Diné people had fiddles violins mandolins they taught each other reels and they started writing their own versions of fiddle music uh and when the contact came back like it was this big <laughs> 
it was this fascinating thing to me, but I could not get anybody to give me money to get this project going. Um, and Craig really didn't like my project, but the, his first chapter was like this fictional thing, but I wanted to do an anthropomorphized uh, version of it in a comic book that kind of opened the story. But I, yeah. I don't remember a lot of it, but he basically like this white guy had two wives and they lived up in the Cuscoquim and they played music together and he would make these violin strings out of lynx gut. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, anyway, way off on a tangent. I don't know why I was, oh, so that project didn't get funded. So I had this comic book stuff I wanted to do. Then I did dirigibles and I was like, I really wanted to do a comic book. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I decided to just take the stuff I didn't do and make the Wintermoot comic book. But Wintermoot was actually the name of the AR festival I used to run when it was all the manifest AR stuff. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I had, the last time I really did a Wintermoot festival, I worked with this comic book, book group called Sousier out of Anchorage. And we did Sousier 5, Wintermoot 5. And I augmented a bunch of these local comic book artists. Sure. Okay, so I, I decided I'm going to make a comic book. And I don't know why I called it Wintermoot. I just ended up doing it because I couldn't find a better name. Um, and moot, M-O-O-T, means a meeting in like Sami in a lot of Scandinavian cultures. A moot yeah. is a, a meetup. Uh, but in English, even though it's a Scandinavian language, moot usually means uh, like it, it no longer matters or it doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. Uh, but in Alaska, moot is actually a conjugation of um, an Inuit language, well, actually all the Inuit languages, but um, specifically Yugtun and Inupiatun, uh, mute, M-I-U-T is how they spell it. Sometimes it's M-O-O-T, but usually it's M-I-U-T and it means people love. So when an Alaskan mm -hmm. hears winter moot, they're gonna think people of winter. Well, the winter, yeah. And, and then and, it's also and, like a riff on William Gibson's winter yeah, moot. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. Totally. Which is an AI, and inside the Wintermoot comic books, they ha I haven't really like published any of it yet, but there's all these different AIs in it. They're more, they're, they're different artificial intelligences than than that. They're like it's not a Gibsonian AI. Um, yeah. Some of them are. It, it, it's it's got its own kind of logic to it, but it's mostly. Some of them are AIs that exist when a network of organisms kind of gets together. Right, right. So like a mycelial like my, almost, network. Almost kind of like mycelial stuff. Yeah, yeah. 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 So like a mycelial network will create an AI. Yeah. The same thing would be like any sort of anthrome or biome that humans are, are changing will create an AI. Right. Or, um, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's that kind of thing, but also natural AIs happen when um, organisms create like a continuum. Yeah. So one of the AIs in the Wintermoot comics, which I don't know if I've ever published this yet, uh, it's called the Godwit Continuum. So there's a bird that travels from Alaska to New Zealand every year. Right. Called the Godwit. Um, so the Godwit Continuum is an AI inside of the Wintermoot world. And Wintermoot is actually an AI inside of the two. It is kind of playing with that, that story, the Neuromancers. Yeah story yeah uh, but that's only because there's cyberpunk so the, it's the first comic book winter moot was a cyberpunk comic book it's, right. it was an inupiate cyberpunk and that first character so this was some, one of the things also that happened in that first shared universe group was um people work so there were some indigenous officer authors but there was also um yeah this is super important yeah definitely so yeah it we, we came up with this way of working if you were working with indigenous people, cultures, Alaskan cultures, it was very important to collaboratively build things and yeah. to uh, yeah. appropriately represent a culture. So there was all these different ways of doing that. The way we had set up for that first shared universe group was basically on the cultural consultants model, mm. um, which is fine. And that's how most things work. Yeah. But when I got to making the comic book, I had actually written this whole other thing that involved characters from the dirigible stuff. And I decided to do them second and do the, the Ogpik 
story first mm -hmm. because I had taken a character from Raven A Cloudberry and went to my artist buddy Holly and we created a comic book character together. And she renamed the character, basically it was an Inupiate woman. So she would go by the Inupiate name right. for Cloudberry. Right. Which they don't, Inupiate people don't actually say Cloudberry in English either, by the way. It's uh, Cloudberry's an Alaska, an English and Alaskan term that's used in South Central and Southeastern Alaska, hmm. but Northwest Alaska in, in um, most of uh, Southwest Alaska would, they don't actually have that. Well, so it's the same plant. Um, it's, a, it's a little berry that grows on the tundra. In yeah. South Central Southeast, we call it cloudberry. They call it salmonberry in Southwest right. and Northwest. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. salmon berry is a high bush, yeah, berry in in where we live. But salmon berries don't grow in Northwest Southwest. Right. So it's this weird thing. So that um, it depends on where you're from in Alaska. You would call it a salmon berry or a cloud berry. Sure. But the Inupiat sure. word was ogpick. So we just redid the whole thing. But instead of just cultural consultants, it became this thing of building characters. And it, I, Holly and I had been friends for years. Right. I just really liked, we were just buddies. Um, yeah. Her artwork was, is like, we had actually never worked on anything together. I just think her conceptual art is some of the best Alaskan art that I, has ever come out. It doesn't involve me at all. It's about Inuit female tattoos. I just think it's fucking rad. Um, so we just made friends and it was really just like that artistic friendships. Mm -hmm. You know, you meet an artist you really like you just wanted to be friends with them and hear what kind of shit they're thinking about all the time. That's one of the fun things about being an artist. You know, I'm never going to do any what female tattoos because that's just completely crazy. Why would I do that? Yeah, exactly. But, but it's cool that she does. It, it's amazing that she does. And it, I'm like, I can't even sell the project. Is she? It's so deep what's going on with them. I'm actually not even being who I am wouldn't be allowed in those spaces. Right. But I totally want those spaces to exist. Oh, yeah. And there's totally common ground outside of that um, for people to do. And this was just one of the things. And what we were working on, it just became this notion that collaboration should evolve out of these processes where it's just your friendships. And you're not, it's because a lot of people are really, you know, they'll make friendships to get consultation for grant stuff artists do this a lot yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's, it's an extractive way of of being yeah. um as an artist this is what a lot of institutions like museums do and, as well they'll, and and, and they'll, actually part of like this larger show you know this is kind of like i'm thinking like this you know these these different layer protocolological layers of networks and that sort of thing and how these oh you know, yeah and that's sort of, oh yeah and, and the thing is is what you're tapping into you know are are into some of you know some of the you know some, some of the some of the first you know and that sort of thing you know i mean i mean in some ways i mean you're, you're in, in some things, ways and, and you're doing with things at a lot of le a lot of levels i mean so say for example like uh, like but you know we were talking about media you know just at one point or another you know we're talking about like the ephemerality of, of digital media, the idea of like, you know, books and that sort of thing, you know, that, that go on one point or another. And it's a, there's two points I want to get at is that, and then on the other hand, it's like oral culture, you know, it's, I, I thought it'd be amazing that the, that the idea that there might be maybe some kid talking about Cloudberry for four, you know, 400 years from now, you know, and sometimes, yeah. you know, sometimes, sometimes oral culture is, is more, more durable than you know any of the and you know any of these other more technological means and the one story you told me once was just you know just amazing about that one you know one one kid you know that's that's just sort of like hey you know it's like i saw this and i speak this and and this is you know this is oh you know, yeah. My, yeah 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 but let me let, I'll, I'll say that story so yeah there was okay. a you big girl in Homer, it was the first showing the winter mood. Yeah. And so this is the Ogpeg story. Um, and we were at the opening, I gave like an hour long talk. I uh, said so the end of the, so while I'm giving this talk and I'm talking into like a podcast system too. So 
you know, there's 50 people and it's a small gallery, you know, like 50 people, which is a lot of people for that space. And she's running in and out of this group of people, this little Yupik girl uh, doing all the poses from the comic book. Yeah. Like, you know, Ogpik's like punching somebody. She would make the punch move. Yeah. Um, and there's this expression in Nupiatun. It's it's a lot like bonsai or, or something. Yeah. In nature, but it's Arika. So she would yeah. scream in Nupiatun, Arika. And yeah. um, she would be running around. Anyway, at the end of my talk, girl tugs on my my sleeve and um she's like Agpik, or i i speak yugton and i didn't see any yugton in in the book and i was like well Agpik's anupi she's like i know but i didn't see any yugton i was like oh well you know maybe, maybe i'll do it next time there's also denina and anna in the book she's like i know but i speak yugton and i want to see a book with yugton and <laughs> um she was like super sassy. She loved all the stuff. And I gave her, I gave her a copy of um, yeah. Wintermoot One and uh, the expression in Yugton for hello, or it, it's, it's bigger than that, but it, it actually translates something closer to like, you know, how the hell are you doing? Or like, what the hell are you doing here? But it's Waka. So yeah. I, I, I told her I'm gonna put some Yugton in the book for her. So I wrote Waka, you know. Yeah. I, you know, I don't even remember what else, but I remember I, I put yeah. a Yugton word in there. So I was like, there's Yugton in there now, huh? And she like took the comic and whatever. Um, but that was like one, that was, so that was the first time I started realizing that particular set of work I was doing. I really had tons of positive stuff. Like that was just yeah. one of the incidents. And you know what? That happened a lot. And then the one thing is, I'll just jump aside, is that, you know, the one thing I think about when I think about this is that I used to live in Sharjah in the U United Arab Emirates. And then, you know, it's like near near where I was at American University of Sharjah, there was a little mall, there was a little Disney store. And in there they had, you know, the little dress up thing. And of course, what they have, they have Jasmine and, and, and you know, Aladdin and all this sort of thing is, you know, the you know, most culturally, co you know, co uh, colonizing thing possible. You know, and, you know, I was walking by and there was a girl dressed up like that. Yeah. And, you know, Emirati girl, you know, which was yeah, kind of OK, you know, but I mean, and the thing is, is that, you know, even the stuff in Aladdin is actually old Persian. But the thing is, is that um, I thought it was just kind of interesting is that I just thought it was, you know, so jingoistic that, you know, that why you want to dress up like Jasmine? It's just like she's the only one of the Disney princesses that look like me. And I'm just kind of going, and, and I thought that was really adorable, but the thing is, is, what's going on here is that, I mean, it's still within that Disney frame. And I think what you're doing is, is that, you know, you're, 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 you know, you're, you're giving, you know, you know, all of these different peoples, you know, this, you know, this, this thing that, you know, that, that looks and talks like them and that sort of thing. And, and that you're working with all these different people from all these different nations and that sort of thing without that colonial frame and that's what i think i think is just absolutely stunning and what i love about this about what you're doing not just you know and this is why i said you know why before uh, when we weren't recording what the hell is this is because it's it's more than you know a book project and some museum shows and some things like this. In other words, what's, what's going on is, is that you're, you're almost sort of creating sort of almost, almost like a, a media superstructure that's giving superheroes to first nations kids and stuff like that. And that's awesome. Hmm. Very kind words. So I got a million things to say about that. I don't know that it's free of colonialism. I, I want it to be, and I'm trying hard and I found that at some point in my life, I use that word decolonizing a lot. And then I, one of my indigenous friends pointed out that just indigenizing was a way better term. Um, yeah. And, and so I, I think that kind of came. And then once that first winter mood came out and the reception was really good. And I definitely had like a bunch of the, armchair cultural experts who are all white, by the way, who usually work at like a museum or something, started giving me all the areas where they thought it was gonna be problematic what I was doing. Like one of them even said, 
the dome cities look too much like igloos and that's a really sore spot for a lot of people and was like yes the dumbest shit i have ever heard in my life like oh my god uh so i i realized i didn't have much patience for like a lot of white alaska and yeah um, so either their need to just have complete erasure of native culture from their life where they have no competency with indigenous alaska they just it's it's unnecessary you know uh, a lot of white Alaska really does keep this sort of, there was nobody here when we got here north to the future, you know, sure mindset, sure. Um, which gets into like this whole other thing when we talk about dome cities, but I probably won't even get into that here. Yeah. Uh, but th then the other ones where they're just on high alert about cultural appropriation, but, but that particular vanguard tends to be really awful. But anyway, so I, I honestly, that first winter move was just, I, I wanted to get the language and stuff right. So one of the things I've started to come to for me, the, the allyship is not something you can label yourself with. Yeah. If, if some of your friends want to call you an ally, that's great. Yeah. But I think that was what started bothering me when some of white Alaska was looking at winter mode. It was either this involves a lot of the native stuff. Why do you care about native stuff? Or this involves a lot of the native stuff. Why are you doing it? So my answer was kind of in the middle of that was I was making a comic book about Alaska. How could I have only white characters? How, how could I actually do that and consider it to be legitimate? I can't. <laughs> so I'm actually quite comfortable. I, I use Denina Kanaga in my classroom. I, I teach Denina Suktu, the, the stories. In my uh, in my classroom with my autistic kids, I we we talk about stories. Uh, I, I use Atna culture in my classroom because of the uh, another artist I work with, Demi Maharis, is Atna manga, yeah. uh, Sagani and uh, Keithia. Like the, these stories, the Yana Dia stories, I use them in my classroom. I'm 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 not an expert, but I'm also not unversed in it. Like I I, I know a lot of it. it. It's I'm around it. I'm I'm comfortable using language and culture in my classroom sure. or with my friends and it's not it wasn't some sort of highly kept secret on what most alaskan artists wanted representation to look like they've been very vocal about it for decades and um some of the people that we were initially working with that didn't end up doing anything with dirigibles of denali ended up making Molly of Denali, the PBS Kids show. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, once we did the the first couple of winter mood, I, I did a, a panel at the Fairbanks Comic Con with, with Dewey and Rochelle, two of the people who invented Molly for Den Molly of Denali. Like okay. they did a panel with okay. us, with Melissa and Demi and Richard and I. But um, hmm. after, after the first winter mood, you know, I was pretty excited to be doing more of that, but Richard Perry, an indigenous man who was part of the Dirigibles project, he wrote one of the sci-fi stories. Right, he right. actually proposed to me about creating an indigenous comic book group. And they wanted to use Wintermoot as proof of concept to start developing comic yeah. books. And I was like, fine. And we, we did use the term shared universe at first because uh, Benel Street Art Center was acting as fiscal agent for some of my winter mood stuff yeah. and i we didn't have another name since then it's there it's not shared universe like that that yeah. was definitely something that happened on the other side and shared universe has become my production company name that yeah. i use with with that group and that group uh fluke cesas which is odd enough for fish head soup uh fluke like, cesas uh, comics yeah so that's um that's Demi Maharis, mm -hmm. Melissa Shaganoff, and Richard Perry, and myself right now. I mean, there's more people involved in it, but Demi's got his Chickaloonies mm -hmm. comic book. Richard's got the Wild Man of Denali, which is based on his dirigibles of Denali thing. Um, but that's all basically indigenous run. I just am like a participant in it. Um, that's, it's, it's like this strange thing, but uh, Shared Universe wouldn't have... Uh, wouldn't have worked for that. I think I was like a little, like maybe I planted, oh. Quick plug. A quick plug. That's just the ash can. The, the full 
the full length graphic novel came out this summer. Did it? Okay, well, I'm just saying I've got you got you got the ash can. I got the ash it, so it's beautiful. So um but that notion of a shared universe mm -hmm. is part of Fluke Cesar. So like okay. inside Chickaloonies, yeah. that universe exists next to the Wintermoot universe. Mm. So we have characters that we've written together that are going to be part of the story. So like Wintermoot 4 is coming out next week. And I got these things. I haven't really named them yet, but they're based on um, this Denina st story called Flea Dene, the, the glacier people. Mm -hmm. But I made these like or, organic, or I guess, uh, cryo mech, where it's like this living glacial ice that that can reanimate a dead body. Right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like these this this glacier mech, um, but those monsters are going to be part of the third Chickaloonies graphic novel. So the first, then they're all like 150 pages. Sure. These graphic novels that yeah. making. So, you know, in a year or two, crazy. the the glacier monsters that are in Wintermoot 4 are gonna be there. But like one of my characters from Wintermoot 3 is from that Moji verse, the, the yeah. Chickaloonies universe. I mean, it's all interrelated. And then um Demi's cousin Melissa, we wrote Wintermoot 3 together with the uh, she's like a cultural consultant, she's got her own books coming out, and then it, it's just like it's a big a big project together uh and we're starting to move from comic books a bit so like it's great uh, there's gonna be more vr and um ar yeah performance so uh demi and casey when they released chickaloonies they had a whole performance they did they they wrote a story basically in that oral tradition and that's the yana dia is what they call it mm. uh but they wrote a story for Fluca Cesas, the, the fish head soup. They wrote a, a, a Yana Diaz story for it and they performed it at the library or That's the book. Awesome. And it was amazing. Uh, but it was also a multimedia performance. So one of the things that started getting really obvious when I was first starting to work with this group of people, when we were bringing in more people and like some people weren't a good fit. I mean, this is how like all the collaborative groups work. Like they don't say this much, but you know, maybe 20 to 30 percent of the people you end up collaborating with are, are going to be people you continue to collaborate or are going to follow through like the, it, finding good collaborators that you really mesh with is, is of course. A, it's rare yeah yeah and uh it, it's hard but this setup's really good but anyway um the, and one of the things that demi melissa and richard are really big on saying when we do stuff is that this is a very indigenous way of storytelling. Um, yeah, the, the and that's shared. really cool. Um, and yeah. So I, I, so I got that a lot of like on the creative capital stuff. Um, one of the things we talked about a lot. It's a, people are just really eager to talk about first or, or the, um, like it's some sort of. By the way, you just you just offhand talked to, uh, talked about creative capital. So I just want to say that this year you got the creative cap got, got a creative capital grant for yeah. winter, winter moot. So you know, fantastic. But oh, you know, but yeah, I, mean, it, it is is, I, I didn't want to let that pass. You know, that's all. So, <laughs> you know. uh, yeah, it's it's one awards. There's there's a uh, Demi actually just won a major award. He hasn't announced it. Fantastic. For Chickalones, they'll be announcing that soon. It's a big one. Um, but a lot of the stuff, I honestly, like Wintermoot 3 got voted the best comic book, single issue comic book of the year in a best of list. Right. And I, this was like a woman out of Virginia that picked it up in New Mexico. It, it, it's just like, it's, it, it's the strange thing. I honestly, Wintermoot's yeah, and then, so and then we're taking this out to Cyprus and I'm trying, I'm, yeah. you know, and we're talking about getting it distributed in Turkey and yeah, of course. I was wondering if you could, you know, for those who haven't read the series, if you could give us a couple, just an in some insight into the narrative and the story that is told over the course of, of the series. Wintermoot is a series of short stories in an indigenized context. That doesn't make sense either, but it kind of does. <laughs> um, there's this amazing thing in um, Denina culture. 
in storytelling. The, the nine of stories are called Sukdu, but um, it's called the navigator cycle. And it's a way of telling stories that's just whatever, like if I'm telling stories about Wade, I just remember the stories I could tell and I tell them without a big, long connecting narrative. I just say one time I remember Wade when he was 10, one time when he was 20. And I tell the stories, some of them are long, some of them are short, but it's this method of telling the stories, just kind of whatever you remember or feel like telling at the time. And you say that. Um, the beginning, middle and end, this sort of shape of stories that came out of the Western context it is very European. And the way stories are told, indigenous stories are told in Alaska, I've just always loved the way they were put together, the way words were used to start and stop things. And so most of my art friends up here are just happen to be indigenous. So we have had lots of conversations. And I remember um, one artist I just adore, Ishmael Hope. One of the things I remember him talking about a lot was what it would look like when over generations, white folks who grew up in Alaska hearing Native stories or, or, or methods, what it would look like when they start telling stories that aren't extra, are not taking from the Native tradition, but are inspired, uh, not inspired is not the right word, when, when it's part of their daily life as well, but they know not to extract from it when they're using it. I hope that makes sense. So I, I started putting these comic book stories together and I, I have a kind of a narrative that goes together, but it's not a novelization. It's not a big, you know, 10 issue series where everything's together. It's, it's short stories, it's, it's snippets, it's, it's, it's navigated through this world that was built based on understanding Alaska. Um, and it came out of other stories. So it's, it's an alternate history Alaska or alternate universe. So in this Alaska, the dome cities that were proposed in the 60s and 70s were built. Uh, grunge rock never existed. It was actually Alaskan death metal. So it was a bunch of um, female Alaska native singers that kind of caught the zeitgeist in the 90s across the world. So there was no Nirvana or Pearl Jam. It was uh, these Alaskan death metal bands. And I mean, it's just random things like that compounded together. And then what it would look like, and honestly, it's superheroes, it's, it's comic books. So the, 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 there's equivalencies or it, it uses a lot of the comic book tropes, but it indigenizes it on the other side. So it's not cape and cowls, uh, you know, it's it's snow goggles and, and cuspics. It, that didn't explain what winter mode was altogether, but it's, it's well, it, uh, Alaskan <laughs> cyberpunk. No, I think, words. no, I think that's great. Um, and it's a really great way to understand using different methodologies to tell stories that break out of Western, you know, culturally colonizing practices of taking stories, appropriating them and repackaging them in a way that dilutes or otherwise damages how like the the vehicle by which that, you know, that meaning is is imparted. The best equivalent I found uh, is like Jim Jarmusch movies for me. Ah, okay. Yeah. yeah Jim yeah. Jarmusch movies are my favorite. I love them. I love him. I didn't realize it till like later on that they really weren't movies for everybody. Like people right. like them and they could watch them and be like, this is obviously a very good movie. Yeah. The eight different cultures, 10 different languages and like no real fixed narrative. Yeah. I, like it's, I'm not going to want to go to a movie theater and, and watch it and enjoy it or buy the thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. But honestly, so I, I, I found that like with me, I like that huge multicultural lots of languages lots of stories really complex deep and then super art house on top of all that I I, I like that in my comic books that's the kind of comic books yeah. I want to make so I, I have to fight a lot to keep like language appropriate because I do like kids reading it oh, sure. um, 
Yeah. So yeah. I, I, I work really hard and I've had to rewrite a lot of stuff to not have that, that kind of language. Um, but I did just a huge multicultural thing. And then watching them develop Chickaloonies, which was definitely made for kids. Like it's a kid's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yeah. You know, it, they could get picked up by Scholastic and it wouldn't be weird. Yeah. Um, but it's the same goals, like getting kids speaking indigenous languages, getting uh, competence on those cultures into school districts sure. across Alaska. These are like way bigger, more important things, but it's really awesome to see people like on the art side, totally like go bananas with it too. Um, and I think that's one of the strengths inside of that group we have is that there's just so many varied things within it. So it, it can have that, that kid's look and that really anime cartoony thing. For some people, yeah, I'm not gonna be doing that, but the stuff I love tends to have, you know, honestly, people that, you know, I know we were making like jokes and stuff earlier, but the kind of people that would go to the new museum or yeah. um, I-Beam, people that go to those kind of places, they're going to pick up Winter Mood thinking it's a, a comic book with like, oh, Captain America, Iron Man. But then when they, they would start flipping through, visually, it's appealing to them because of... Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, I, I am yeah. able to get into the like creative capital spaces where it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a very high-end art thing. Yeah. And... You know, a lot of those people have that kind of, I don't know, they act like it's a sophistication, but really they just don't like comic books or video games. And that's okay. But a lot of times it's just seen as, you know, lesser than aspects of culture. These things have been typically seen as, you know, a, a form of pop culture. And those things have been, you know, can see, you know, considered as, as less than, you know, pop culture is less than high culture and that sort of thing. And, and, you know, it's like, you know, yeah, not necessarily right. so, the, so. The thing I go back to when I was at Rutgers in grad school, yeah, I was teaching the the uh, intro to art, whatever, like at the art history. Because you thing. got Persepolis, you got Mouse, you got you know, I mean, yeah, you know, oh, you oh, got, oh yeah, yeah, you get you, you got all the comic books, but um, anyway, the textbook they were using was Art Since 1945. It was written by Benjamin Booklow, Rosalind Krauss, yeah. Ellen Bois. Awful textbook. I hate it. The thing that bothered me the most was the lack of digital media in that book. And it was brought up to Benjamin Booklow, you know, hey, you didn't include new media. The 21st century, people are making new media work. Right, yeah. His response immediately was, well, I felt it was unimportant because when you look at new media artists, they're as interested in Diderot as they are as Spider-Man. So the fact that media artists put Spider-Man and Diderot on an equivalent playing field of importance and cultural relevance was offensive to Benjamin Booklow. Therefore, well, they did not- And then you come back and saying that, let's put this way, says, so what about Warhol, you know, taking the Brill box and the, and the Campbell soup can? Come on. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it, it, there's, just hearing no, that's that- That's not an argument. Thing, no, it's not. And I do see some people in the art world, they do stick to that. Like, what's the point of going to a gallery if I'm going to watch a video? I can watch movies at home kind of thing. Like, there's there's this underlying kind of thing about, like, the... Yves Allen Bois, like, that was his whole shtick, was how painting is, like, the most super only way artists should be expressing themselves because it's got a purity and a... It's just, it's it's fine for some people. It's not going to be fine for me. Yeah, um, I mean, there's a it, I don't think it's fine for you. Reality, yeah, no, 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 not I, no, and I've had conversations about this. Yeah, so yeah, but uh, creative capital is really one of the only like well-established institutions, and I'm being really light here that will actually pull in like comic book projects. Right. I, I Ivan Velez's work is incredible. Yeah, and they've been funding. Uh, his stuff there's not a whole lot of comic book projects on there there's not a whole lot of video game projects but they're one of the only groups that's really funded a lot of the really 
the, the like the really great new media artists too. Uh, and maybe not so much the last few years because they got rid of the. This is like way off on another tangent, but yeah, uh, it, it, it's it's interesting to negotiate those spaces and sure. and and to to have a comic book that that's a museum. But for, for, from its literary function, its visual art function, it's mm -hmm. designed as like high-end conceptual artwork. I mean, that's 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 like what I make. That's just that's kind of who I am. The other stuff is that it, it can actually just transcend those spaces and be other things. And honestly, I didn't apply to creative capital as augmented reality, new media or a comic book. It was a social practice project, which is what it is. And, and, and actually, I think it, as we're getting down towards the end on this, is that this is what I think is really important about, about this in the context of the, you know, my including this is in the show. In other words, it's like on one hand, you know, the, you know, all these parts together, you know, put together as a social practice, as a social practice project, which deals with all of these notions of power that I, I'm 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 looking at, but not in the same way. But also the thing is, is that kind of like these layers in between, which are really incredibly rich. And I yeah. think, and, you know, and and the thing is, is that the th the thing is, I think you know your project, um, you know, deals with a lot of. Um, um, you know a lot of a lot of human condition in 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 forms of media art that are rarely seen and the one thing i think is interesting is is that i think you know and i don't want to get into nfts i really don't i'm just gonna say but the one thing is is that i'm just gonna say right now like the craze on nfts or vr or ar or things like that is that in many ways i almost kind of felt like even even like in the afghanistan war it's just sort of like saying using technology as somehow as solutions for human situations. And the thing is, is that, you know, in other words, we have this technophilia, you know, this technophilia that, that links to power and the, and, and the whatever industrial complexes and all these sorts of things. When really what happens is that, you know, some of the richest places, you know, you know, might have some of these things, in it, but the but the the foundations that are underneath it, you know, are are the human connections and the and the and the communities and the ecologies and all these things that undergird them, you know, yeah. and 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 I think really what's going on here is that actually this is what I think makes this this particular project actually unique within this exhibition, and it's the reason why I wanted it in there. No, I so I gotta say I I think the content it, it's is is the thing and yeah I agree w working in the group and those collaborative things like actually there the the content is is rich enough and fulfilling enough that it could it could stand alone experientially for me yeah just those conversations uh, but I mean they they get. It's just it's so all inclusive, which is why that that stuff like just got so expansive. There's so much of it. it, it I'm kind of curious how much of it I'm not going to be able to use when right. this winds. Yeah, um, but I'm I mean, gonna there's real, just, I'm I'm going to be real curious seeing how how long this goes. You know, because I've been in collectives. Yeah, now, the thing that that have gone on fifteen years. Uh, the longest collective I've been in has gone on fifteen years. You know, yeah. so I mean, it's like I, I'm I'm real interested in seeing how 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 long and and you know how this how how this almost like this mycelial net you know is gonna is is gonna you know. But I've been I've been upfront with that group that I'm not a a comic book artist and that I'm just making a comic book right now, but that you know I, I'm but, kind of mere curious. But, but as but, you said before, this thing has gone through different morphologies. It does, and I am starting to like the idea of facilitating more. And, yeah, and one that's of the things, uh, but also Wintermoot, and it's not really like becoming much of a thing right now. It's still kind of working itself out as as things are developing. But 
the characters are actually open source to mm. Alaskan kids. So any kid in Alaska is allowed to do whatever they want with any of the characters in Wintermoot. There's just like these five cultural competency guidelines they have to abide by. Yeah. Uh, and we're still a draft form with them. But it, it just involves basically this is how you interact and creatively collaborate with cultures. But is if they follow those, it's completely open to them to do whatever they want with any that's, of the characters. That's, that's awesome. It is, in, in theory, we're going to see how it goes. I'm going to be starting my first series of presentations. So and that's one of the other things with Winamook. You get asked to talk to kids a lot. Uh, yeah. But I'm going to I'm going to do my first presentation with kids where I'm going to talk about the open source nature of the stories with them this month. That's like a whole nother set of things. <laughs> where are you going to do it? Here in Anchorage. Okay, cool. Um, I was invited by Title VI, which is a educational sure. group. Yeah, yeah. That, okay. uh, it, so I've worked with Title VI a lot before, but uh, they call it Indian education. But it, it, sure. in Anchorage, Title VI uh, provides counselors in schools okay. for all the Native kids. Yeah. But we also do after school programs and stuff. Um, but, but I mean, this is like getting into like the deeper community connections that yeah, yeah, yeah. Lucas Asos is doing so um which is super and, and yeah. I, like to, I like to see the the, the fact that it's it, you know it, it's evolving you know this is like yes. say to us is 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 a you know a really pleasant surprise yes and i'm hoping it kind of stays that way and I'm, I'm also hoping we're able to stabilize a bit financially because it would be really nice to do big book launches since especially stuff like Chickaloonies is going to be every year or so yeah. they're going to release like a thick little graphic novel okay cool um, but i mean yeah we got grants and things in place where um you know every publication we have is supposed to go in perpetuity one copy to every village in alaska there's 300 of them mm -hmm. rural villages that are uh and then every school and every library in the state yeah. is supposed to get a copy uh, through this grant that the Alaska Library Association put together. Yeah. So hopefully okay. that one could start going through. But I, I mean, also, it's just we, we talked about representation. No, we're coming to the end here. But um, representation, it, it goes a lot deeper than just um, have, having characters that represent the different audience. It, yeah. it, it's also, you know, tons of rural Alaska is off the highway system a lot of those kids have never actually held a comic book because they don't have total access to them. Um, you know, they know what they are. They read them. A lot of them are digital, which is how most kids in Alaska will like contact me. They'll, they'll get a digital copy of winter moon. Yeah. Um, but it, it's also, you know, making sure all those kids have access to it and doing workshops with them and, uh, you know, encouraging them to be making stories. It's just, it's, it's a, it's a wider it's kind of viral yeah. isn't it yeah it, it feels like that but once it starts going uh I, i've seen that a lot I, before this summer i would see it as a presenter people would would get really excited and talk uh watching demi and casey do chickaloonies wow. I, you know i got to see it as an audience member mm -hmm. um which yeah i mean we took our nephews to go see one of the performances and yeah Nice. it's um there's a different feeling in the air when you're doing cultural work like that oh, it, it's, nice. it's 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 a yeah it's different it, it you just the whole i love doing museum shows and gallery shows those are super fun, well, of super fun. I'm, I'm, I'm not talking bad about them and i i yeah. I, I, I a, a good show it's great to have somebody say something nice about the stuff yeah. you're doing but, yeah, but there's with, nothing like this, you put a kid coming up to you and saying, "Yeah, the other the other stuff is just so much more significant." Yeah, in the in the long run, or in the the sense of like why you do things, yeah. that that one kind of changed up. It it, it just it, it it makes a difference, so you can actually yeah. feel it. So it it feels, I don't know, you you feel more 
I guess centered. The, the teaching special education kind of did that for me. Sure. I, I think honestly, tons of artists, you know, we had talked about being so many of them being undiagnosed neurodivergence that tended towards empathy, right. which is why they think they don't get diagnosed. But I think they would find a lot of joy in special education if they went there. Cause I think a lot of us see or can, can see in the kids. Cause we, most of us had to like figure out how to manage our daily lives. We know how it would have, or what it was like when people were trying to talk to us and what we would have preferred they would have said to help us out. Yeah. So it just like being in that mindset, I think a lot of artists would find a lot more fulfillment. And then when you make that connect, I think a lot of artists would not move away because I, I, there's always something to like that shock jock sort of way of thinking or doing like the next biggest thing. But then yeah. there's also something a lot subtler and, and um, s- soothing and thoughtful on, 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 on playing some other notes. Yeah. With it. I agree. It, 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 it's different. Um, you know, Through the Mesh is really a show about info politics and geopolitics and kind of the, the issues of the network. And oftentimes in, in, in previous historical shows that have looked at these kinds of issues, um, looked at the issues of, uh, you know, technological sovereignty and um, the harms that are done in algorithmic environments, you know, there's a lot of focus on the technical aspect. And I find that in a lot of ways, like we don't fo- focus on the softer aspects of network flows as they relate to appropriation, um, copy culture, um, imitation, or um, otherwise, you know, co co-optation, co-opting the co-opting of of content from other communities. I mean, this is a conversation that extends from Black Twitter to the NFT world. Um, right. And I'm and you know, in a lot of ways, I see this methodology of trying to hold on to those traditions from or, oral storytelling, from community-driven storytelling and kind of replicate that in this product feels like a really um, a, a really uh, cogent way of dealing with these kinds of problems in the network. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, I don't know, do you have any thoughts about that and, you know, ways that we can try to, you know, push and pull on the softer side of these issues to protect, preserve, um, people, culture, their stories. And I got many, many, many thoughts on that. Uh, so the biggest one, specifically for winter mode, um, you know, I'm, I'm basically writing and illustrating and coding the AR stuff all by myself. So in, in one aspect, it's kind of got like the um, a tour thing where it's the person that does all of it on their own kind of thing but that's not really what is I'm, I'm drawing and I'm, I'm putting a lot of the story together but there's a group of people that we've kind of banded together to to tell stories and through that network we're able to dip into all sorts of aspects of Alaskan culture that aren't aren't super well known, I guess, is the easiest for people outside of Alaska. It it would it would it is just not as well known the differences. There's very subtle differences and major differences. Uh, but there's you know there's 22 Alaska Native groups, uh, more if you count some of the the moving, but you know over 20 languages the the regional differences are intense you know some places don't have natural trees growing there because of the willow winds or too high up in the arctic circle uh some places you know get negative 50 but it's a, a rainforest it's just the, and then the people um you know there's three linguistic isolates so languages that don't relate to any other language in the world um the 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 depth of the creation stories going back 40,000 years it's it's just it's this huge thing but when when we write or when I put a winter mood story together I have basically a rough outline and with the team of people we work with 
um, we do a cultural enrichment process. So everything in the story gets basically, we come through it to find all the Western tropes. So if, if it's a fantasy story, you know, make sure it's not, that if we're going to keep things like a vampire or a werewolf, and I'm just saying stuff that, that um, we, we, we look through it and then find the cultural equivalency of what that would be in the regional context. How do you l use language with it? Uh, but what's preferable is to actually develop a story from, uh, from an indigenous model. So kind of as a group decide these are the kind of stories we want to tell these are the kind of characters or or things um the biggest one i i saw is just the the difference say in alaska of, of between good and evil which is a very western construct this good and evil you know it's so binary um and even in western literature like the the big the big thing that they get into is when somebody breaks down the binary of good and evil <laughs> Like this is like the most basic thing. Nobody's totally good. Nobody's totally evil. Every culture on the planet, like people are just complicated. Um, but that pretense of good and evil it is is very heavily. It's used a lot by colonial cultures. Cultures that like to colonize will use good and evil. Um, but there's a lot of stories in the Alaskan context and the way. The story starts, the arcs of the characters, and then the endings just don't soothe the Western imagination. Like uh, a lot of times, if somebody spends a lot of the story doing good things, making the right decisions, and making the world better, they get punished still at the end of the story. Like that's a, a, a regular, or the stories just stop before something goes on. Uh, there's this incredible Denina story about Guchin, who's this, uh, it's a Degali Denina, the, the mountain people, and uh, he's a shapeshifter. But one of his suktu is, um, he, his, his family's killed, so he makes a golden ax out of a sheep horn. He pours that and he just, he goes on this life of revenge you know, just that that going around and finding all the people that had done him wrong. And then the story ends with he realizes how purposeless that was to do. So he ends up uh, convincing a kid to chop his head off with the, the ax. That's how the story ends. So it just, and it goes super fast. And the, those stories are told in moments. Uh, they're so quick. But anyway, the, the, the thing I like about that, so I'm, outside of that context like I'm, I'm giving you a story that that has we're talking about networks like such a thick network of cultural references inside of it that somebody outside of this regional area where i'm at would have a very different assumption in their head about what that character looked like what they sounded like um those were all site-specific stories so that happens at Kenai Lake, which is, you know, three hours from where I live. It it happens site specifically. It, it it's it's told in this area for the people in this area, um, and you know, people outside of it can have relationships with the story and enjoy them, or what have you. But there's this there's this element inside of regional and site specific storytelling that. There's, I don't know how to explain it. I would imagine every region on the planet would have this. Um, Alaska is really unique in that a, a, there's the ability to do that still. Like it hasn't been so, you know, that like little card game where you try to three little cards and you're just hiding it and you kind of get lost on, on where the things are. There, there's, there's a deep, history and everywhere you walk you know you can if, if you were so inclined you could learn the indigenous place names of almost everywhere in alaska relatively quickly 
Um, but it's it's a different that's a different set of network things, and I think that's where the the Thuca Cesas the the comic book group we have that's where we try to keep stories or, or or when we make the stories more specifically we know the audience is site specific so the first audience is always going to be we're telling stories for kids in alaska second would be the adults of the kids in alaska and then stories for everybody else and it's not to say that everybody else shouldn't have the stories it's just that it's got a purpose and it's its purpose is that audience in um they're really the only ones that it, it's going to matter. If the, the the quality of what it is we're doing is only going to be contingent on on that audience. Like we're not confused by that, and it also makes it. I don't know. I I don't, I don't have the right word for this. It's um. It's community, but it's it's also. Okay, here here's the thing. What, what um. One of the times when I was designing one of the superhero stories we had, um, I, I hate the bill, billionaire trope in comic books. Iron Man, Batman, Iron Fist, like the, just these like white billionaires that go beat up poor people as superheroes. They got no powers, they're just super wealthy um, for the most part. And then all of them have these sidekicks. And I've never understood the sidekick either. Like from my point of view, the billionaire trope and the sidekick is just so lazy as far as telling a story but uh in in the group we were started discussing well what would it look like if there was uh a superhero in alaska who was a billionaire there's no billionaires that live in alaska all the money in alaska gets taken from it all the oil money goes out there's no billionaires that actually live here um and what does a sidekick look like so um the the culture is called potlatch culture in Alaska. So if somebody was a billionaire there or in an indigenous context, uh, their wealth would actually be measured on how much they give back, not by how much they can accumulate. So uh, we actually have a billionaire character who, who creates all this, this tech wealth, um, but it's contingent on how much he returns to the world on what he's doing. So a lot of it, the creating the billions was just to literally close the Bering Sea to barges so that they could rebuild the ecosystem and there was not gonna be any more um, people coming and trawling through it. And then the sidekick, um, so this is in a Yunungan context, so uh, Southwest Alaska in the Aleutian Islands. Um, a sidekick would kind of translate to a master and apprentice, but the way that would have been set up was that the apprentice, and I'm using that word really lightly, literally just watches the adult do things all the time. The adult doesn't discreetly teach them or have them do anything. The adult treats the child as if the child uh, is an elder because the expectation is the child is gonna be better than the adult when they do it. So the child is treated with the reverence of somebody who's better at the the trade, and then they, they observe the adult do these things until they just start doing it on their own, and it's a natural thing. But um, instead of the sidekick being this Robin character, it's it's a revered, familiar connection. So it, that that story we're still working on, but um, I mean it's that kind of stuff that that changes it up and makes it more. I think it's a better story, personally, when, when you see that whole context. It's more interesting, it's more thoughtful, and then it actually has a function, a social function that extends not just the regional or the indigenous worldviews, but, but um, the values in the, of that culture. Right? It, it, not just embracing them or or appreciating them, but building with them. Wow, absolutely. Um, oh, there's something kind of crazy going on in the background over here. I'm not sure what that is, um, but I really only have one more question for you, and that's you know, 
you were talking earlier about, you know, that these stories are for these communities. They serve a purpose um, and they have a life of their own and a, and a, and a role in, in, in building that. And so I'm wondering what happens though to those stories when they leave and go elsewhere? Like what happens as they travel across the network? Um, and for say the, um, you know, the average, you know, person on the other side of the world who comes across one of these tales, like how would you want them to, to receive something like this? Wow. That's actually super deep. Thanks. <laughs> so I think really that, that, that primary audience is just, we're not making the stories to cash in on the culture. Like, I think that's just sort of the given that we're not trying to extrapolate to make a product that's going to have a larger mass appeal. Um, kind of that, that model that had been going on forever. And it still goes on when, when people from the outside decide to, like, I'm going to write an Alaskan novel or whatever. Um, they get a really basic, mostly 100% inaccurate redoing of the cultural stuff. And then they just tell us that random bland story that so many people love telling with a bunch of inappropriate cultural details. So, and I am answering your question. I'm, I'm trying to pull it together. So I, I've been surprised every time people outside of Alaska read the stories for a couple different reasons. One, they never complain about the amount of languages I'm using because that's one of the big things I really like doing and that a lot of my indigenous friends and family have, have kind of in their more honest moments said, we like to see indigenous languages that aren't translated. It's just somebody speaking another language. Like it's not translated. It's, it exists on its own. Um, you could translate English to that language kind of thing. Like it's, it's, a, it's a switch up on it. But nobody outside has complained about seeing three or four different Alaskan languages inside the comic book. They're actually kind of like, that's kind of cool. You did that. Or, um, wow, I didn't understand half of the references. But I'm, I'm imagining that if I knew what they were, it would make it even better because it's a really good story. Or... I was expecting a comic book. It was like way more of a, a literary thing than I was expecting. Uh, th the reactions are just always nice at this point. So I'm kind of waiting for that shoe to drop where somebody gives me a, a real earful about something. <laughs> but what I want for people outside of Alaska when they read the stories, a couple big things. <laughs> It's the big silly things that a lot of people like to kind of make fun of a little bit right now because we're we're in a, a growth period culturally where a lot of people are having a hard time with the way the way the forest is growing and some of the graphs that we put on some of the trees. So I like I, I want people to see representation that's not token. Um a lot of times, any character that's not a cis white dude gets tokenized so fast, or they just overdo it on the other side because they're so nervous about getting it right that they get weird <laughs> about it. So there's this just kind of this balance of things that I think would make a story better when people read it, hear it taste it, touch it, smell it. Like it's, it's, when you, ah, I don't have the perfect word for it. On Sesame Street, they have an autistic character. And the only time that character gets brought out is when they want to talk about autism. If you've ever spent time with an autistic person, the amount of time they spend talking about their autism, it's very little. Uh, it permeates their, their life for sure, but their, their obsessive 
thinking on stuff or their rigidity or some of their uh, physical behaviors or just so much more in the world somehow. Uh, and it, I think that would ring true for everybody. So uh, an indigenous character, just not bring out, being brought out to do the indigenous thing, but just watching the whole story play out. Uh, this this winter move four is a main character is trans. Wrote that character with a trans actor director named Caleb. But the biggest thing was if we had a superhero who's who's a trans man getting the language perfect where it wasn't a story just about people doing a trans thing but <laughs> that, that that the importance of that aspect of their identity personality coming through uh not superficially but also informing how they are as you know in this context as a superhero um, and then not making it gimmicky, which is also hard. So I, I think we actually did a really good job at it when it, it took so long, like this was the longest winter moot we ever did. And, you know, I have tons of friends in that community, but I, I the, the comfort level of working with say indigenous Alaskan cultures was like my, my experience with it is way deeper. Uh, and I had just been doing that longer. So this one, I, I think the, the language was really good on it, working with Caleb and, uh, <laughs> it was a struggle, but it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's like this beautiful, amazing struggle to see this thing. You're like, holy fuck, we did it. Like it's a, oh. <laughs> To, like they're, they're a superhero and they're fighting monsters and it's not they're not screaming the word trans the whole time it's just like it's a straight up it's a, just a good story um and i'm hoping it doesn't get questioned a whole lot when people look through it they're just so like fuck that's rad i did i didn't i at 21 years old making the kind of artwork i made i would not have thought about this kind of stuff it wouldn't have occurred to me you know what i mean like it, it's just it's a different it's a different thing it's a different zone i'm and i'm happy with it right now so you know what and, and it's a good place <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> anyone i think at this point i think i think this is a good i think this is a good place yeah, no, I'm excited for folks to interact with these stories and read them. And, you know, for anybody who's not coming from an Indigenous community, particularly not an Alaskan one, I encourage you to have some, you know, some sensitivity and an open mind and understand that you're reading stories for a very particular community. And uh, it's a, it's a, it's, 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 it's a, it's a, what's the word? It's a gift to uh, be included and get to uh, uh, learn more. Um, thank you so much for for being here with me today, Nathan. I really appreciate it. Um, and I'm excited for folks to see the show. I am too. <laughs> awesome.